Um, so I know our time is short for this really rich discussion, so I'm going to get us underway. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Redefining Risk. My name is Yi Wei, and I serve as the Vice President of Impact Capital at IFF, a community development financial institution serving nonprofits in the Midwest. I will serve as your moderator today for a conversation about the role of systemic bias in how financial institutions conduct due diligence and underwriting. Whether it's a foundation, a CDFI, or a commercial bank, we all have certain requirements for investees to access capital, be it a minimum annual budget, a certain composition of the board, and in many cases, existing wealth to serve as collateral. While these requirements may appear to be race neutral at surface level, we know that the outcomes are not. Why is it and how do we fix it? To impact these questions, I am joined by a wonderful group of panelists representing a diverse group of capital deploying institutions. Deborah Schwartz, Managing Director of Impact Investments at the MacArthur Foundation. Matt Roth, President of Core Business Solutions at IFF. Neil Richardson, Vice President and Director of Business Impact Group at US Bank. And Neve Christopher, Head of US Business Banking at BMO Harris. I want to emphasize that we are all on a journey and at different places in our journey. We seek your feedback and input as well. Please type any questions you have in the chat box and we'll try to get to a few of those at the end, including weaving those into the conversation. So diving right in. The nature of this conversation can be very personal. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm not gonna read all of your illustrious bios. All of our audience members can find those online. Um, but I want to start by asking you to share your personal story of bro what brought you to this work and how has the most recent tumult in our society affected your sense of purpose at work? Uh, Deborah, can I start with you? Sure. Can you hear me okay, Eve? Yeah? Yes. All right. All right. Um, I haven't done too many of these virtual conferences, so it is a little um, hard to get your bearings, but I love that I can see my co-presenter faces here on my screen. I can see my notes on another screen. And I have no idea who I'm talking to because I can't see any of you. So, um, so I'm just going to talk to Neil and Neve and Yi and Matt and uh, hope that works. So um, I, I would just say that the, the arc of my own journey to this place, and I've been asked many, many times because I used to teach as an adjunct at the University of Chicago. I taught undergrads a class called the business of nonprofits and the social sector. And a lot of them wanted to know how did I make my way through my career to land up at the MacArthur Foundation, which is admittedly an amazing place uh, to have landed. And I actually got there 25 years ago. I've been uh, heading the impact investments team for 20 years. And I would just have to say that um, there was no plan, there was no career path, there no, was no prescription, um, and I think there seldom is for any of us who sort of live in this funny hybrid world between money and mission, where we are driven by mission, we're driven by purpose. My grandparents, who were such inspiration to me, were just driven uh, to make the world a better place any way that they could. Um, and my father carried that um, passion forward and I think gave it to me. But I was also always fascinated by the power of the market. Um, I am just an admitted finance nerd or I wouldn't be on a panel about how do we combat systemic racism with different kinds of due diligence. Like that's, that's for finance people, right? So um, I think I, I, I stumbled and found my way through the opportunities that presented themselves and sometimes they weren't so obvious. So I have counseled women who were victims of domestic violence, who were on the path to recovery and employment. Uh, I worked with a child welfare agency to turn around a, a pretty troubled financial situation. Um, I was an investment banker working with hospitals and municipalities. And uh, now I'm a proud member of what we call at um, MacArthur Team Platypus because we are just like our grant making colleague, philanthropic institution dedicated to doing good in this world, but our instruments are loans and equity investments and guarantees. So that's why we're a little bit odd. Uh, so that's my journey. Wonderful. Thank you. I love that platypus image. <laughs> Inject some. You, you would not love it. 
if I go into my other room, there is a, a stuffed platypus <laughs> that we are still planning to send to the president of our foundation who started not that long before the COVID crisis. Uh, thanks to one of our amazing team members, Allison Clark, who Matt knows very, very well. Uh, one year, every one of us <laughs> got, found ourselves with a stuffed platypus puppet. <laughs> <laughs> And that's one of the things I love about the impact investing space. It's a very wide tent um, for people who traditionally looks, look like ducks or beavers or those that look like both. Or whatever else, yes. Yeah. Uh, Neil, can I go to you next? And can I ask you to unmute first? I had to mute some of you because of background noise. So just make sure you guys unmute yourselves when you guys speak. Sure, uh, I'm Neil Richardson. As, as you spoke to, I am the director of the business impact group here at US Bank. Uh, my team really focuses on um, creating products, services, and experiences and evaluating our business development strategies at U.S. Bank to ensure that we're creating greater access to capital for women, people of color, and low-income communities. Um, and most recently, we've had a, a strong commitment and a, 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 a direct focus on how we serve the Black population. Um, to close gaps in economic outcomes and remove historic barriers to have systemically uh, disenfranchised and marginalized uh, people of color. Uh, what really brought me to this work as being one, as it's very evident, I'm a black man uh, in America. And so this work is not just something um, that I do every day, but it's something that's part of my identity of how I show up and, and, and where I show up. And so growing up in a low income community a household um, that was low income, but also a community of color that was systemically um, and racially divided. Um, and so I live in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I grew up in the north side of uh, Del Mar, which is very well known um, across the country as the Del Mar Divide, where 99% of the population on the north side is, is African American, and on the south side is 70%. Um, white. And also along those lines are many economic inequities that exist. Um, on the north side of Del Mar, the uh, home values are seven, average to 70,000. And on the south side, they more than quadruple. And that has had negative impacts just on myself, but also uh, my family and my daughter as I look to uh, pass down wealth onto her. And I think that's what we're here to talk about today around how do we disrupt intergenerational poverty uh, through dismantling um, inequitable practices as it relates to underwriting, lending, and investing. Um, I also started a nonprofit organization in St. Louis to address many of those economic inequities um, by working with youth in the inner city to rehab homes and also take ownership of those communities. So 30% of the profits um, of, of the home sales actually goes to those student scholarship fund. So some of the work that I that I am able to leverage um, at U.S. Bank, understanding finance, kind of as Deborah spoke to, um, but using that experience and that creative juices and my passion for serving the communities of color specifically has really brought me into this role um, at U.S. Bank and finding ways in which I can leverage my platform, my, my purpose, my time and experience to create greater access uh, to capital for all people. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your home. Um, a lot of what you talked about really is at the heart of this conversation. So we'll dig in. Uh, Neve, can I ask you to go next? I had to unmute. It's like mechanic the minute someone tells you you have to go find your cursor. Um, so I'm Neve Christovic. I'm the head of U.S. Business Banking for BMO Harris Bank. So we're in eight states across the nation. Uh, primarily, when we say business banking, uh, our focus is on the small business customer. So revenues in size um, from 100,000 to let's say 5 million, uh, with lending even capping out at 10 million. So sometimes we creep, we creep up higher than the 5 million in revenue size, but it's primarily the segment served through the branches um, and the small business sales force. Uh, I came to the role, uh, I came out of commercial lending traditionally uh, and even workout. So I've seen kind of the default side of the bank. Uh, but uh, small business is truly my passion. I was raised by small business owners. I was a, raised by immigrants who started from scratch with nothing when they got here uh, and knew my dad's banker primarily because uh, my dad didn't like banking and he was intimidated by it. And so 
Uh, my mom did a lot of it. And then at 12, my mom said, here, you take it over. And so I was doing their banking at age 12 and running their books and talking to the accountant. Well, that was good or bad. I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, and like I always try to tell my people that work for me, um, just because someone knows how to run a hair salon and is really good at cutting hair doesn't mean they understand banking. Uh, and people are intimidated. And so, and they're intimidated by, do they qualify for a loan? Do they qualify for a credit card? Um, and sometimes, you know, they make bad decisions, not from um, just out of lack of knowledge, you know, leaning too much on their personal credit in the beginning, because they don't think they would qualify for debt. And so when we look at that, that's the general small business problem, but that problem is really exasperated um, in, the, in these communities we're talking about today because they don't have the networks often to lean on. Um, and in all honesty, like I don't think the banking industry is entirely trusted by that group, right? So I think we're here today to kind of really discuss like how do we bridge that gap? I'm excited to hear Neil's uh, look at Neil nodding his head because I think we both can agree there's work to be done. Um, and I think we have uh, always looked at CDFIs and nonprofits to build that gap. Um, and now I think we're looking at stronger partnerships to say, you know, how do we educate? How do we become more embedded in the community? And how do we step up um, to fill that gap? Wonderful. Thank you. And last but not least, Matt. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are um, calling in from. But. Uh, so uh, my formative years were, were growing up in, in the Bronx in New York and attending public schools, elementary through high school in the Bronx. My high school had the uh, distinction of being the largest public high school in the country at the time, 5,500 strong. Um, and that was my first also exposure. We were, about, we were almost evenly one third white, one third black, one third Puerto Rican. Um, and then I, uh, through marriage, deepened my connection into the Latino community and uh, at my 10 year mark at Harris Bank and in my career, Harris Bank in Chicago, I was getting some career coaching from our CEO who told me it was time to start my own lemonade stand um, at, within the bank and asked me what I was interested in. And I knew we had an interest in the Latino market, even though we had never done much there. So I asked him if, uh, if we had to approve a budget, if I could run it, start it and run it. So I did that for five years um, and then I, uh, uh, wanted to do the next thing, and I cold called Shorebank, uh, the largest and oldest community development financial institution that Deborah knows well uh, in Chicago. Um, and I started consulting with them for five years and, and doing a lot more work on the south side of Chicago, which then led me to want to start and spend five years in a grueling uphill battle to start a black owned bank on the south side of Chicago that got very close and did not get to the finish line. But when I was getting close, uh, at the end there, uh, I had the good fortune to uh, make my way into IFF. Um, and so IFF is a half billion dollar CDFI that serves the Midwest. We have seven offices across the Midwest. We're focused on the nonprofit community and we really sit at the intersection of finance and facilities. And it's a pleasure to be with everyone and with my co-panelists. Great, thank you all for sharing a little bit of your stories. Um, it's amazing how all of us have come from different places that are converged at the same point because we're interested in answering some of the same difficult questions. Um, so I'll start off easy <laughs> in terms of the questions. Um, Matt and Deborah, um, as a foundation and as a community development financial institution, your institutions have mandates of serving the underserved. So tell us a little bit about how your organization is trying to ensure equitable access to capital, specifically communities of color. Um, Deborah, can you start just briefly giving some overview of what you guys do? I'll be happy to, uh, Yi. And I just posted into the chat a link to the MacArthur Foundation website, Matt. Um, and under our work, you'll see all of our programs um, I neglected in my journey. The rest of you were much more organized. You spoke about your organization and your journey, and I um, did not. So you can see whatever you need um, there on the MacArthur website. Our impact investments work um, is an integral aspect of the foundation, and we've been doing impact investing for over 35 years. Um, and Shorebank, which Matt just mentioned, was the very first organization to receive what we call program-related investment. This is a tool that the uh, Internal Revenue Service allows private foundations to use. 
Um, and it's a tool that really is so perfectly suited and was kind of grew out of the desire to bridge the gaps that Neil was talking about and that animates so much of our work, whether it's with CEFI partners like IFF, partners um, like the banks that are here today or with other kinds of impact investors. So we have a number of programs and initiatives. One that I would just call out as maybe an example to illustrate ye the way that uh, we do this work is a collaboration called Benefit Chicago. And that's a hundred million dollar fund that we um, launched back uh, four years ago. We're just about done with all of the deployment and investing work. Um, and half the money in that hundred million dollar pool comes from MacArthur's own allocation for impact investments. We have a five hundred million dollar allocation that my team and I manage. And the other half comes from a whole range of other investors channeled in through uh, a note issued by Calvert Impact Capital. And it's a key partnership also with the Chicago Community Trust. And many of their donor advised funds are actually channeling dollars into this fund to support uh, what we would consider to be very high impact uh, investments. So let me just give you an example. There is a real estate developer uh, named Leon Walker uh, who's really creative and really bold, working on the South Side, predominantly in a neighborhood called Woodlawn, but in Englewood and some other very hard hit neighborhoods in Chicago that struggle to access capital. And that's where he's focusing his real estate work and he was still early in his trajectory with his company. So we were able to provide $5 million through ARC Chicago LLC and that's the fund we created to implement Benefit Chicago. Um, and just let me share one transaction that has followed since we made that $5 million loan. Um, Leon focused on a vacant uh, shopping center on Chicago's South Side. It had an empty Target store. Like a lot of property of this kind, it was really blighting the neighborhood and inhibiting uh, development and um, deteriorating the quality of life around it. Well, in that one project, he was able to bring in Blue Cross Blue Shield as an anchor investor to put in a customer care center, a call center. Um, they're going to put $20 million into the improvements for that site, and they expect to employ over 500 people on just that site. So the vision and the ability to execute, um, the fact that we are able to support a really um, uh, mission-driven, Black-led firm working to benefit the city's Black communities. This was for us and exactly the reason that we created this kind of fund. Great, thank you. And Matt, just so people can get to know IFF a little bit more, tell us how we are trying to make sure the capital ends up in communities of color. Yeah, so when we, you know, uh, among the um, the manifestations of systemic racism is, is around access to tools and resources. And so when we were thinking about access, we partnered with the JP Morgan Chase Foundation and with an organization called Fiscal Management Associates, which is a consulting firm on, on financial matters, um, to launch a program aimed at nonprofits led by people of color. Um, we're doing these in cohorts of 10 organization, organizations each. Uh, the commitment the organizations make are to, to send two to four of their executive team members uh, over the course of a 14-month uh, training cycle. And it's classroom setting with, with fiscal management associates. It's peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, there's customized uh, counseling. We provide at IFF real estate consulting. We provide facilities assessments. Um, so it's a really rich and robust program really aimed at increasing access to those tools and resources that best position nonprofits to be successful. Um, we've had two great cohorts in Chicago, two cohorts in Detroit. We're launching cohorts in Milwaukee and Indianapolis and St. Louis um, and in Ohio next year. Um, so we're really pleased about that. But And that's, again, just an example of one way that we're trying to um, address that issue. Yeah, so I think it's um, not a surprise that CDFIs and foundations target communities that are uh, traditionally underserved. I'm curious, as um, publicly traded companies, um, commercial bank representatives on this panel, 
Uh, how do you make a business case for serving those underserved? And um, what are you guys doing to make sure the capital reaches communities of color? Well, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at the first step. Um, so we are actually just uh, going to launch in Nova in this fall, uh, a minority uh, business vertical in the small business segment uh, that actually creates a special purpose credit program, which broadens our risk appetite uh, parameters. And so when you look at that business case, when uh, traditional underwriting always ties credit scores to losses, uh, it's the only history we have. So if it is or is not accurate, it's the way that we model. Uh, so when we look at the, um, so it does drive higher losses, whether you believe they happen or not it, in a theoretical moment, that, that's all the data we have. So um, it does drive um, higher losses to broaden your risk appetite. So we have put a business case together that looks more at, um, for lack of a better term, a break even scenario. Um, and then we align that to our purpose as a bank. And so when we looked at the value, we do lend to CDFIs, we do donate dollars, and we actually looked at our role in the community and how empowering it would be for a business owner to go into the branch around the corner from their business and, and qualify for a loan. And so uh, we find that there's a really big gap today between who qualifies at a CDFI and then how long a journey they have to have before they qualify in banking. And so we're trying to bridge that gap because there is, in, in my own experience, and I truly believe, it is very empowering for a business owner and their employees to see that they get a full relationship, their children to see that they have a full and robust relationship, and that banks aren't just there to collect deposits, but that we're willing to put the deposits back out into the community. So from a day one business case, uh, we looked at it more as um, part of our, our purpose to boldly grow the good um, and to not look for the type of returns we look at from other portfolios. Uh, and then I also would say we probably did, uh, we're very conservative on upside. We do believe, like, we will collect more deposits. They're valuable deposits and they do pay a return. So I actually believe that by being in the forefront of the community, showing our commitment to the community that not only will we attract um, minority business owners who were outside of our traditional risk appetite, we will attract more who are inside our traditional risk appetite. So. Um, because uh, there's a commitment to the community. So I actually believe uh, our worst case business case that you put forward for the risk and the regulators, um, we will beat it. And so, uh, you know, you put it out there to explain it, uh, but I think when you actually get behind the purpose and the momentum, uh, it will pay for itself, uh, I think tenfold. Um, and for me, uh, what's really mission critical and what we look at when we, when we launch a program, which it is piloting in Chicago, with an expectation that it will go to all of our all of our markets, is that what's mission critical is the partnerships with the CDFIs. Um, we're looking for partnerships with the city of Chicago as well, um, because to really make this work, we have to lean on the strengths of everyone involved, uh, because there are things that we don't do well. We're good at banking, uh, we're good at financial content, but you know CDFIs are better at coaching. Um, and so we're gonna train our bankers to help them as much as we can. Uh, but we also know that there's other things that CDFIs do better than us. Um, and then city of Chicago, like working with them on licensing, like they're really good at licensing in the city. So why aren't we throwing joint education programs with them on licensing? So as far as a business case, um, yeah, it's, it's not as profitable as, you know, commercial lending, but we find a home for it. You find a purpose behind it, uh, call it spade a spade and then beat that business case so you can just grow it. Wonderful. Neil, what are you guys doing at US Bank? Yeah, so I, I, I know we all talk about, you know, the, the racial wealth gap, which is, you know, 10 to 1 as it relates to black households versus white households. And I know uh, Mackenzie recently uh, uh, did a study showing that, you know, if we were investing equitably, that would add an, an additional value of $1 trillion in our GDP um to black by investing equitably in black led businesses and organizations and supporting and uplifting really the black community so that's the best that's a strong business case there but also we can't just look at the business case we have to look at what is the right thing to do as well by our community and by our stakeholders and so what we've done at us bank uh specifically within our cdc is develop what's called our racial equity initiative where we leverage our new market tax credit investing, our affordable housing investing, as well as our community development financial institutions that we are partnering with deeply 
that understand and have closer proximity to the everyday issues that these small business customers are having. Uh, we recently invested um, and provided a grant of $1.1 million directly to the African American Alliance of CDFI CEOs in order to help uplift them, get greater capital to those CDFIs, but also help them create a collective strategy and vision about the importance of black led CDFIs and supporting uh, small business across the country. Um, they are a new coalition that just coming together, but we want to make sure that we are able to support and fund their priorities to reach their collective goals and have a shared voice as they're allocating and looking for greater resources to serve the most vulnerable communities. And unfortunately, due to COVID and due to the racial injustices that are that are uh, really a two pandemics that we're facing right now in America, um, we must intentionally invest in those communities, in those businesses that understand um, those challenges that these communities face every day. Um, what we are also doing is looking at all of our business development practices as well, and to understand what are ways in which we are not just continuing to go back to the same customers every day. While we value those customers, how do we expand that box? How do we work with um, other industry groups how do we make sure that we're funding organizations like the Urban League, like the NAACP, Operation Hope, really strong nonprofit partners across the country who are trusted partners in these communities, help fund them, uplift them. And as, 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 as Naeem said earlier, we want to build that trust through those relationships, um, but also understand that when they are ready for uh, a U.S. bank loan, or more conventional financing, we want to be that partner with them um, to help guide them into the future. Um, some of the things that we aren't able to do because we are a highly regulated, publicly traded financial institution is not appraisal lending. And that, that's the great work um, that Matt and IFF is able to do. So what we bring to the table is capital to help fund those innovative deals and structures and projects that ultimately will be proof points that changes legislation that ultimately impacts the systems that are deeply um, causing uh, the root issues of racism and disinvestment in black and brown communities today. Um, so those are just some of the ways in which we are partnering with TDFIs across the in industry, as well as evaluating our internal processes to ensure that it's equitable um, and, and, and it's just. Great, thank you all for sharing a little bit more backdrop for the specific programs and initiatives your institutions are taking to make sure capital gets into community. Um, I want to move into the heart of this conversation, which is about the underwriting and due diligence process itself, because I think it's very related to um, a social consciousness that we as a community have come to uh, started to come to terms with, which is systemic bias and systemic racism. And I've heard it described as the air we breathe or the water we drink, and it's just, we're swimming in it and we don't even know because it doesn't necessarily have a face, right? It's not just a racist individual, but it's the, um, at the surface level, race neutral policies and rules and requirements and documents that's needed that apply to everyone, so it must be fair. But on the other end uh, of the sausage making factory, the results are not equitable. Um, so Neil referred to something called non-appraisal based lending. I'm um, wondering, Matt, if you can speak to that a little bit as an example of what we're talking about in terms of systemic bias in the system. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. So IFF, we were founded over 30 years ago as a non-appraisal based real estate lender. And honestly, it's a little bit shocking to me that we're still one of a very few CDFIs in the country that is that that is a non-appraisal based lender. And it is a way, you know, we did not use race explicit language over the course of those 30 years in talking about why we did non-appraisal. But it really is with an with an equity lens that 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 um, that we do that. And it does help unlock capital into communities of color that have structural barriers to accessing that capital. Um, and I, I do and we do proselytize all the time. Neil is absolutely right. Like for regulated financial institutions, they can't. Um, but CDFI loan funds can. Um, and it's a matter of 
uh, really allowing yourself to know, like for us, we, you know, at IFF, we have, we're one of five CDFIs in the country that have the top rating from ARIS, which is the S&P of the CDFI industry. We feel like we have now proven out the, the case that you can successfully do non-appraisal based lending and, and have strong asset quality and, and move money into communities. Um, so we, we push that. Um, and rely on cash flow lending. That's what we underwrite to the strength of the nonprofits leadership team, the management, the board, the revenue streams. Um, and all that said, we're still like we're we're happy we do that. It allows us a, a lot of flexibility. And by no means are we even close to you know stopping there. We realize we are there are so many things that we haven't really done an audit of in terms of our practices to see where our own um, biases have. Um, kind of uh, muddy those waters for us and, and had us contribute to systemic racism. So we're we're auditing everything we do. Our target market uh, has been for years, um, you need to have 500,000 of revenues, you need to have been in existence for five years as a nonprofit with three years of audited statements. We make exceptions frequently, but that's still our target. And now we're, doing, we're going back and doing an audit to say of the ones that we've approved with those exceptions, how did they perform? Maybe they're not so critical to, to asset quality, and maybe we can remove that lens and have another way to increase the flow of capital into communities of color. Um, so that's one example of through our underwriting um, that we're doing that. There's a whole other source uh, um, uh, conversation around sourcing of opportunities and making sure that IFF is showing up in communities, um, which is equally as important, but I'll stop there. Yeah, that's a non appraisal based approach is something that I think a lot of people don't even realize is a big barrier. Um, and it's only recently that we started to use it with a race equity lens. And that's just one thing in the process, right? And there could be so many more. Um, Deborah, can you speak to a little bit about what you guys are learning at MacArthur in terms of how your processes are or are not leading to? Uh, reaching your target communities and what barriers you hypothesize still may exist. Thanks, Steve. So I, I think something that Matt pointed out is that you could be doing something for a long time in the impact investing space, but maybe not reflecting on it and understanding it to be part of the pathway to greater equity um, and inclusiveness. Because one of the things that's kind of come to the fore for me over these last several months in all the many different kinds of conversations, many of them quite challenging and very important, um, is that we have always seen our impact investing as a way to bridge gaps. But we've been pretty technocratic in thinking about it. We talk about capital gaps, not just the appraisal piece, but we talk about track record and the ability to to get behind an organization and an entrepreneur who maybe doesn't have the track record that a traditional uh, bank might be able to support. Uh, we talk about innovation risk and how that can be a barrier to making progress on climate change, let's say, for example, because we don't want to get behind a, a business sitting on that valley of death. We want to wait for them to get to the other side. If we're a traditional investor, our opportunity is to get in front of that gap and to try to leap over it with them. So we've always had a practice um, of stretching, you know, we've always understood that our type of impact investing was all about pushing the envelope and being more uh, creative and flexible when it comes to things that others might see more traditionally um, as, you know, insurmountable um, uh, conditions or challenges. Let me just say a little bit about the due diligence practice that we actually use, because I think that is part of what folks um, are asking about. Um, and I will say that even though we often structure things in ways that are very flexible and bespoke and customized uh, to accommodate the needs of an impact-driven enterprise or fund, um, our diligence is pretty traditional, I will say that. And we use, for example, if we invest, we just did a set of investments in equity funds. We took the ILPA standard due diligence template. We adapted it to include more impact oriented questions. Um, I will say that that questionnaire actually includes a lot around ESG and also around DEI. And so we were asking questions about 
whether you have whistleblower policies and whether you have um, policies around advancing diversity within the workplace, retention and so forth. Um, so it's a very comprehensive uh, look at those equity funds. I wanna give an example of why this matters. Because for we, we noticed with one fund we were um, considering, um, not for this investment within just, I think the last two years, that they didn't have many uh, women. There wasn't much gender diversity in their organization. And we asked about it and commented about it in the course of doing our due diligence um, review. And one of the things that happened soon after is they added a woman to their investment committee. And so we sort of saw that as a reminder that what might not seem all that um, influential or super innovative or creative, the act of due diligence, the act of asking the question, of interrogating what an organization is thinking when it comes to diversity and equity, that can be a powerful way uh, to shape things as an impact investor. Um, for our loan funds and things that are not um, the typical kind of venture and private equity fund, um, we take more of a camel, a traditional camel approach. It's very holistic. We're looking at the right, do they have the management team? What's the staff look like? What's the governance look like? What's the capitalization? What are the earnings trends? Their liquidity, their systems, you know, nothing. there's nothing uh, blazing or, or new here. It's very holistic. Uh, part of let's in our terms, lower interest rates, no collateral, uh, less track record, longer time horizon, all those things that we can do as a catalytic capital investor, part of what that requires is doing that deep due diligence and getting really comfortable that we are partnering with folks that we really believe in and that we're ready to support because that's what's going to make that more non-traditional, more catalytic investment succeed. And we do have a good record of repayment over the years and considering the unconventional profile of many of the things that we've done, um, we feel like the, the due diligence is, is what really underpins that. Um, so it's a conversation always. Um, this is for us not a cookie cutter process. This is all about relationships and trust. Um, I saw some comments and questions in the chat about whether outside folks uh, come into that conversation. We do very often engage experts who are familiar in a domain that we might not know as well. So education or agriculture or SMEs in Latin America. I mean, there are a lot of things that we've actually been working on over the last few years, solar energy in India. Um, that go beyond what my team of eight people know. And in those cases, we do seek to find people that are either in country, because we think that's important, or in sector and really have understanding of those issues. We do not use um, what I would call participatory methods for our impact investing. We have done some of that in our grant making. And we're currently in the process of a special grant making initiative uh, related to a bond issue that we uh, put out uh, in the summer. And we raised additional money for grants to address uh, what Neil so correctly named as the twin crises, right, of COVID-19 and racial injustice. That's, that's what those grants are about. And we have a whole cross-foundation group working on those grants. We announced the first 25 million of them not long ago, including some grants around voting democracy in the election with a focus on uh, organizations that are led by uh, BIPOC individuals and working in those communities that they are seeking to uh, advance. So, um, so we don't use the participatory method for impact investing. We are using external advisors around this bond issue, grant making. We've done this in, with our arts, uh, equity, culture, and the arts in Chicago. We've done some participatory methods there. It's a really interesting question about how you can how you engage community voice, um, and we're going to be reflecting on our impact investment policy statement this year. We've just begun that. It's going to take us a while. And so I'm excited to have 
had this conversation with all of you today because these are ideas that we can um, bring into our work and reflection going forward. Um, so I know that's a really long answer, Yi. I would just say one last thing. I mean, I think for us, this falls under something we call the just imperative at MacArthur. And this is a journey that we've been on for a number of years as an organization, starting under Julia Stash when she was president and now with John Palfrey as president. And the just imperative, and I'll throw a link into the chat, really is calling on us to interrogate everything we do from the perspective of equity and justice. So that's our diversity of our supplier chain. Are we gonna restructure um, the way that we do certain parts of our grant making work? What does our employment and our staffing look like? Who is on our board? All the aspects of the organization fall under this umbrella. And what this conversation brings for is that the way, even though our impact investments in our view are quite catalytic, we still need to reflect on and interrogate every aspect. Yeah, that's a really rich overview of the different aspects of the organization you guys are trying to deconstruct. We're getting a lot of um, engagement from the audience and questions about the details of each institution's underwriting processes and criteria. Um, there are two themes that I would throw out to the panel to start uh, tackling. One is, um, should we be looking to redefine risk, right? This is the, um, the topic of this conversation. What have we learned about who is risky <laughs> or what looks like risk or what we per have perceived to be risky but really isn't and is just bias? Um, and other questions around um, the onerousness of the due diligence process. We like to think we reduce risk and mitigate risk by doing a thorough underwriting. And um, that is how we ensure that we make good decisions and make sure that the debt is responsible both for the investor and the investee. But that process requires a lot of resources to be able to address um, this question. So how do we think about that as a systemic barrier? Um, Neve, you were nodding a lot, so I'm going to uh, ask you to jump in after you unmute yourself. Yeah, I'll take a stab at it. So, um, you know, I think we have ideas on it, uh, and to quote the beginning, we're all on a journey, right? So uh, right now we look to broaden the risk appetite based on, for lack of a better term, the old-fashioned way of underwriting, which is credit scores. Um, and then we observe how the portfolio uh, performs based on those credit scores. But if I would look at where the industry is going overall and where banks have to catch up is, um, in this way, the FinTechs have been a really great leader in this area on how do you underwrite cash flow in the last 90 days that really predicts what's happening in a small business versus looking at a score and a tax return that might be nine months to a year old. So when we look at like where we are today, is automating and working and opening our old kind of methodology with a lens on how do we get more dynamic and more like our fintech partners that looks at what are the cash inflows and outflows in a small business, which are more predictive of what's going to happen in the next nine months, six months, or a year. And then at the same time, there's product development that can happen at the same time. Fintechs have been really good about building um, products that collect on cash flow and do intermittent pay downs based on that cash flow. Um, so there's garbage on the product. Now what fintechs have also done is charged a lot of rate for those products to get the payback for their technology and, because they're not deposit gatherers. So like we don't have to charge those rates as a bank if we develop those products so we can step into that gap. Now that is a multi-year journey. You can only imagine it's like we're a big bank. Big banks are like almost like the Titanic. It takes a while to change the mindset and change the technology to catch up with that. So we're on a journey. What we could move quicker on was broadening risk appetite and educating our bankers. I call it demystifying banking. Our bankers in the field have always been fill out the app, someone in underwriting underwrites it and they get a decision back. We're educating our bankers on what are the inputs in underwriting so they can have better conversations with the client and so we're taking the initial steps in the hopes that it will inform us and then we can build better technology in the journey. Cash flows are a lot more transparent and take a lot of bias out of it. They're not score based um, and they can tell us what's really happening. Um, you know, because 
what's a big burden for almost every small business owner is we underwrite to tax returns. Every good business owner limits how much they pay in taxes. So if that's the same document we use to prove underwriting, we've kind of gave them a catch 22. If you pay the IRS a lot more, you can qualify for debt, but then you have less cash flow, right? So it's this really vicious cycle that is small business underwriting. So when you tie, that's the proof of cash flow to a credit score that is already proven by the system to be depressed for people in the minority community, it's kind of a double ding. So we're in a journey, we're very early in our journey, but there's more work to be done, not just by the bank, but by the whole industry. Yeah, yeah and I'd add to that, um, I think our job collectively is to really um, tease out perceived risk versus actual risk. Right. So, yes. you know, I had mentioned that in my bio, I started Hispanic banking at Harris Bank. I opened branches in Latino communities. The first branch I opened was ha hitting a wall because we were literally rejecting 70 percent of the Latinos who wanted to open a savings account. Because at that time, not unlike other banks, we had you had to have two credit cards. You had to have a credit score, you, like all these things just to open a savings account. So. We actually, we had a mandate though, once I re elevated that to the CEO, we had a mandate to resolve that and we did. Um, and the industry has moved, right? Even taking, banks used to rely on uh, the credit scores from the mainstream, but now we know like rental payment history is really valid. Whether you're paying, you know, other uh, utility bills is really valid. So we've moved, but that takes intentional effort to, to take those apart. Um, and I think that's where, again, with at IFF, we, we feel like we've proven on the appraisal side what's real versus perceived risk. I mentioned some of the other things we're looking at. There are other pieces, right? Even, you know, we had a really interesting credit committee meeting about a year ago, a very small nonprofit in, in St. Louis. Um, and one of our questions is always about board and who's on the board. And we realized like there's, there's bias in even that question. And what does it mean to be a strong board and who's on the board and the commitment to the board? And so kind of unpacking that, we, we believe um, there's real rich um, payoff to getting uh, capital into where it needs to go um, if we can pull those two apart. Yeah, and yeah, at, at US Bank, <clears throat> we've been really focused on um, our new market tax credit lending specifically. Uh, we received $65 million of new market tax credit allocations in the latest round, and we've made a commitment um, to leverage those resources to address uh, the racial wealth gap. Um, and that included um, gathering a and developing a advisory committee, which is 11 community members um, and they have that have expertise in racial equity, but also in tax credit financing and finance. Um, so they understand not only the financing structures, but also racial inequities that exist and the type of projects in which we should be allocating our limited and scarce resource of new market tax credit towards to really address the racial wealth gap. Um, and so we've been really focused on that and our um, advisory committee actually has control over what goes to our credit approvals. Um, and so they review those documents they review those transactions, and if it doesn't meet our racial equity characteristics, then those deals get rejected. Um, and so that's how we're trying to hold ourselves accountable to the work, but also bringing in people who don't look at risk or look at these communities from a disadvantage, from a scarcity mindset, but they look at it from an asset-based mindset. And I think that is the advantage that a lot of CDFIs actually have um, and that we work with is that they're more relationship focused and they understand the, the, the value of that business that brings to that community itself. Um, and it's not just about you know, how much revenue they're earning, it's about how many jobs they're creating. If, if, that, if that community business is no longer in existence, how does that cripple the economic uh, structure of that community or that neighborhood itself? And those are the intentional decisions that we're making by bringing in community members to not only um, hold us accountable, but actually help us develop strategies to invest in a more equitable uh, manner. Um, and also we have to look at our internal hiring practices. How are we ensuring that our business development officers, our underwriters are aware of unconscious bias, of racism, and how they could be ensuring that um, they have the proper training to recognize what inequities exist and how to elevate those things 
um, across the board. And so one of the areas that we're focused on in U.S. Bank as well is elevating projects, partners, businesses that are within our pipeline that are led by people of color to, to understand if we're not able to lend them capital today, why not? And then start creating a toolbox of solutions to help address those inequities. And one example of that is partnering with foundations to provide foundation-backed guarantees on some of our lending efforts. And so if we understand that there is a wealth gap in America, we must also understand that there is a collateral gap as well. And so if we are lending on the base of collateral on assets, then we also must understand that those inequities um, that exist on the wealth gap standpoint will create inherent inequities in the lending field. And so one way, one solution that we found to close that gap um, is working with foundations and bringing them in um, on transactions with, with Black-led uh, businesses that have that challenge. And I, I know a lot of foundations are looking to leverage their balance sheet. I think this is the most impactful way for us to address that racial wealth gap is by providing those assets, that balance sheet, that these minority communities don't have because of what I spoke to earlier around generational poverty and generational uh, wealth not being passed down um, to help create opportunities for Black-led businesses, for minority-led businesses to be on a e more even playing field, which is the center of equity. Yeah, go ahead, Tepra. So, you know, huge, uh, plus one, Neil, to, to what you just shared. And it made me just think about, again, our friends at Shorebank um, that Matt mentioned at the beginning of the call, because when the reason we made our first investment ever as an impact investment in 1983 in Shorebank was because that bank was sitting in the midst of what had been a redlined community. Redlining began in the 1930s. It was really a government practice that literally said, to banks and insurance companies, do not lend, do not do business in these communities. And what that did was not only deeply harm the communities, there's research showing that even 80 years later, after the Fair Housing Act, everything else that has happened, those communities that were redlined still disproportionately um, fight against disinvestment and, and economic um, challenges. But, but what that did was it left those communities with no track record. So that even when a bank like Shore Bank wanted to do the mortgage lending, if anyone wanted to do the mortgage lending, they could no longer look at a history of homeowners paying mortgages to be able to gauge how to think about that particular credit. And so they had to be able to leap over that chasm and be able to start doing that lending. And nobody was going to give them money to do that if they were coming from a traditional mindset. And so that was for us the opportunity to use a program related investment and to give them capital to build that record of success. When the financial crisis hit in 08, 09, mortgage credit dried up again and neighborhood housing services of Chicago came to us because they had a very successful lending program focused on lower and moderate income homeowners, predominantly people of color and the capital was going to dry at the exact moment that we needed those homeowners to be able to help stabilize their communities, to be able to hang on to their homes, to refinance their homes, and there wasn't gonna be any mortgage credit. So we used guarantee. And that's, uh, Neil, you made me think of that as you were just you know, emphasizing the importance of the guarantees. In that case, we used the guarantee partnering with a CDFI to, to do a very major long-term home mortgage program. So, you know, we've used guarantees to help the city of Chicago big transformational project with the mortgage lending. Um, there are other, many, many other applications, as you point out, for guarantees, and it is a powerful uh, tool. Um, but I would also underscore that it requires the same kind of mindset as doing direct catalytic impact investing. You have to be able to think beyond just the traditional metrics. You need to be able to get comfortable to lend without collateral because oftentimes, as we've noted, that's the barrier. No credit score, no collateral, 
maybe no track record, maybe an uneconomic, you know, scale um, of operation that needs time to grow. So those are all the challenges. And it, it, it just does underscore for me that while we absolutely need to interrogate the due diligence as we've talked about in the underwriting and to think about what's hidden inside of that, um, the reality is that every program choice we make in setting up a program, whether it's in a bank or in a CDFI or in a foundation, we're sort of trying to decide what are we trying to accomplish and who are we going to serve? And so we are always at risk ourselves of leaving people out. You know, whether, whether the bar for the due diligence is too high or the collateral requirement or whatever it might be. So we're just always in, I think, a situation where we need to be asking ourselves, are we doing everything that we can? Can we add another program? If this program is for this purpose and serving this group of entrepreneurs. Can we add another program and partner in a different way to fill the gap that that's leaving? So I think we just have to recognize that this is a very long-term journey. The good news is there's such great partners um, out there wanting to do this work more than ever, I think. and. Um, and we all need to just find the flexibility um, that each of us might have, and it will look different. Like what's flexible for us may not be possible for Neil and Neve, but um, something else might uh, might work there. Yeah, and I think one thing that's about this conversation is that we're all recognizing and accepting that the problem exists. I, I think my question, you know, as um, a person coming from IFF, an investee of the other three panelists here, um, now that we've all acknowledged the need to take on and redefine risk, take on more risk potentially or redefine it and making sure that definition is more inclusive, how do we do so in a way um, with our partners so that uh, we don't feel like it's a catch-22, right? Because when I go out and raise capital, I love that I'm able to say that we've had a sterling track record in our 33-year history. We've never been delinquent on a repayment to an investor. And I'm sure as investors, that's great news. <laughs> but um, that could be put at risk as we start experimenting and trying new things. How do we cross that chasm? And how do we lean in with our different comparative advantages to do so? Well, we have a saying in our segment that when we try to do uh, PCL is just as powerful as marketing dollars, um, which is provisions for credit loss. So if you um, go into mode and know that I'm trying something new and I'm going to take on extra losses, um, there's a cost of doing business and learning. And then you have to kind of figure out where do you change what, what is it and isn't working. And so you kind of have to be okay with it not being pristine and and that's why we pilot things right and so we do that like we're gonna go digital online with credit cards for small business this year um and in some markets we're gonna have a different risk appetite to see what works and so i think instead of thinking pcl is this dirty word um it's it's a learning it's the cost of learning uh and so as we learn for new methodologies or we test risk appetite to see what's really a barrier and then giving us a little bit of leeway to say, yeah, it's maybe not as large of a portfolio as I want off day one, but I'm gonna take a smaller portfolio, put different parameters around it and learn from it. And then just accept the loss as the cost of doing business instead of being so risk adverse and so afraid to have that conversation with the regulators or investors to say, PCL when it's deliberately used is very different than PCL because I mismanaged my book. And I think as bankers, we have to get away from it just being a dirty word. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to work under leadership that thinks PCL can be a tool. And so um, that's kind of where we are in our journey is that we, we're willing to put some aside and test them versus um, it always just being a bad thing. Yeah, from a loan fund perspective, um, you know, we're fortunate that we, and again, the first piece I'd come back to like separating out the real versus the perceived, like I think that's job one for us. And then when we isolate the actual potential increase in risks, it's partnerships like what we have with Deborah and MacArthur on arts and culture organizations across Chicago, where um, 
we wanted both of both of us wanted to get more capital into arts and culture organizations, but it was in a way that was definitely going to be higher risk. And so MacArthur came in with incredible support to enable um, IFF to be able to do that. So working together through strategic partnerships to funnel capital out is um, is an important uh, part of the toolkit. Yeah, and one thing that a U.S. bank we're prioritizing our most flexible capital um that that's most and most patient capital um we're looking at our racial equity work we're looking at um not only just minority-led businesses and black-led uh, cdfis but also what are our other white-led cdfis doing around racial equity what are their missions what are their values and as we're looking to have our limited resources uh deployed we want to make sure that we are partnering and, and investing, whether it's grant dollars, philanthropy dollars, or our um, patient capital, or even our tax credit investment investment dollars, with people that are aligned with our core values, that are um, going to continue to work in communities and hold ourselves and themselves accountable to the people who live there. And that is what racial equity should be about, is when we're investing in low to moderate income communities, how is that investment actually impacting the people that live there? And those are some of the metrics and visions and strategies that we're looking for through the underwriting process, not just from our minority-led customers and, and businesses that we support, but more importantly, on our white-led customers. How are you going to leverage these dollars to support um, job opportunities? If you're investing into a manufacturing facility, what are their hiring practices? How are they making sure that they're creating diverse workforces that represent the people there and they're not hiring outside of the community? Um, a lot of times we just wanna make sure they have a plan in place. And that's part of our due diligence process through US Bank as we are selecting um, our partners in our tax credit um, equity investing uh, spaces today. So I think that has um, allowed us to not just, not just understand um, the universe of ways in which we can improve, but how do we leverage our influence within the industry um, as being one of the largest tax credit investors? We're saying we, we want to prioritize those customers and businesses that are willing to go on this journey and challenge themselves along with us to invest in racial equity. And I think that's um, how we as a, as a um, industry become better and stronger by partnering with each other and holding ourselves accountable um, through the influence that we do have, and that comes in the form of investment and capital that we deploy. Yeah, I want to build on this concept of accountability because there are a couple of questions coming in into the chat. Uh, lots of people are interested in understanding who within your organizations set policies and rules and makes decisions to fund, and what we've learned about the uh, gender uh, movement um, in terms of gen uh, women's rights. Uh, is that when women are represented in boardrooms, uh, resources get out to more uh, women-led organizations. And so uh, there's a question for all of you in terms of how are you reflecting on your organizational structures and the power dynamics and centers of influence in terms of who gets to make these decisions? Well, I, I'll jump in you just to follow up on something I said a little while ago. So for us, we have this overarching uh, effort throughout the foundation called the Just Imperative um, at the MacArthur Foundation, where we are looking at all aspects of how we operate internally and with our stakeholders and partners externally. Um, so certainly that's the frame within which we are having conversations around these topics. Um, I will say right now we have a pretty traditional structure. We have a board of directors. Um, it's posted on our website. I will not keep posting links to the MacArthur website in the chat. <laughs> I'm just very proud of myself because it's my first virtual conference where I've managed to actually post links and talk at the same time. I'm feeling very, very accomplished. Of course, not as accomplished as I did getting actually into the hop in space that was that was my big accomplishment for the day so um so we have a board of directors it's a really fantastic board of directors so i do encourage people to visit the site and see who it is um, we have an internal impact investment executive committee um, and that is chaired by our president and is the other members are the general counsel of the foundation our chief investment officer and ken jones our chief financial officer 
that's the the decision making body we put that in place 20 years ago uh, when we started to really formalize some of our institutional practices around impact investing um, so for now um, the way things work is we design a program we get board approval in general for that uh, creation of that program for example the catalytic capital consortium is a global initiative in partnership with omidyar network and rockefeller foundation which we launched last spring so the approval comes at the board level more of the implementation details happen at the program level with some oversight then from our committee every impact investment we make goes to our internal committee and if it's over a certain size or it's a direct investment rather than through an intermediary um, all direct investments go to our board of directors for approval which is the same as for all of our grants there's no essentially it's the same process as we use for the grants with this added layer of a special oversight committee because we're managing this pool of revolving capital the half billion um, and as i mentioned before we have been looking at some participatory mechanisms on the grant making side it has not been something that we've taken up on the impact investing side it is a little hard to think through how that might work but we are definitely thinking a lot about the issue um, that i've seen in the chat today which is how do we engage with community the the intended quote beneficiaries which even itself is a problematic term but how do we think about getting connected close enough on the ground to make sure um, especially when we're making investments in latin america in india in africa in a lot of places that are not easy for us to just go to and um, spend a lot of time individually how do we make sure that the funds and the enterprises we're supporting really are proximate if not of the communities um, that they're seeking uh, to engage so i think that's a really important takeaway from the conversation and I'm looking forward to both what ideas there are already some that I've pulled out uh, of the chat and noted that there's some work that our friends at Dahlberg are doing I, I really look forward uh, to staying in this conversation and thinking about those things together thanks Deborah Neil you're on mute Neil that's <laughs> Oh, good. That's the fifth time today only. So, yeah. <laughs> um, um, so at U.S. Bank, we we have been on this journey as we talk about journeys around racial equity um, for about six years now, um, and the majority of our efforts actually started internally, um, looking at our hiring practices, doing many of our anti-bias, anti-racism um, work as well. And so what we've done is not only um, elevated the work and trained our internal team, we brought some of our investor partners such as IFF along with us on that journey. So as we're thinking about creative ways to invest in racial equity and build shared understandings and shared experiences around how we can improve internally and externally, um, I think that's been a, a helpful process for us. And also, we developed um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion council within U.S. Bank that, that evaluates all of our um, hiring practices, our growth and development strategies, and all of those things to ensure that we are having a diverse representation of U.S. Bank um, uh, across the board, whether it's at our executive level, level at our credit approval levels, and also um, in our business development teams. And because I, I am really an advocate for if you have somebody that, that looks like you and can share those lived experiences, they're better advocates for you because they inherently understand the challenges that you're faced with and they can speak um, in a more direct way on your behalf in front of many of their colleagues internally that are making those decisions. So that's why we focused a lot of our initial work internally and then over the last really year and a half, almost two years, um, through the development of the business impact group, which I have the privilege of leading, we focused on evaluating all of our business practices, processes, and, and reallocating our capital in a more equitable manner to ensure that um, uh, women and people of color-led businesses have a fair chance and, and equitable opportunities to access that capital 
And now we're putting tools and resources in place as we're becoming more educated on those challenges, such as foundation back guarantees, such as creating funds specifically to support the pipeline development of affordable housing developers and other initiatives that are really founded not only on external research and knowledge, but also are founded upon the inherent challenges that we've recognized throughout underwriting practices and putting processes in place to ensure that we address those gaps head on and through partnerships uh, with foundations and, and with CDFIs uh, such as I. Thanks so much, Neil. Uh, Neve, do you want to have Wonderful. a call um, to action? Thank oh, you so back, much, <laughs> Neil. Sorry, I froze out and I, we were so uh, prematurely proud of ourselves, Deborah. <laughs> I saw both you and I got kicked out and came back in, but here we are. <laughs> um, in the last four minutes, I'm going to wrap us up. Um, it's been a really rich conversation. Uh, a lot of interesting questions from the chat. We didn't get to all of them, but uh, I think there's a lot of interesting ideas from the audience that we can take from um, this conversation. And as we said, it's all a journey. One of the things that we touched upon um, across the conversation is that we all have different flexibilities uh, in terms of how we experiment and move forward. I'd like to all uh, to conclude by having a call to action from your vantage point of what you can do um, as a commercial bank or as a foundation or as a CDFI to help move the ball forward uh, in racial equity in lending. So I'll start. Uh, I would say our call to action in the bank is we're actually looking at everything from um, across the gamut. So we're putting uh, targets and plans in place from uh, small business, consumer, all the way up through our commercial groups to make sure that um, not only is our risk appetites um, working in favor of all people in the community, but also our bankers. So it goes to recruiting um, HR, tar the, not targets, but HR practices, making sure that we're representing the communities we serve. Uh, because while we feel underwriting can be blind, uh, at best, are not a blind, how many times you're putting people through the process at the same time. So if you don't have the boots on the street that are either in the community or all the way up through the commercial, uh, that we, you know, everyone kind of relates to their own, as we say, right? So like we have to make sure that we have a good, strong pipeline of commercial bankers that are diverse just as much as our small business bankers. So we're looking at our hiring practices as well as risk appetite. Um, and programming that is across all of our spheres. You know, banking is traditionally very siloed. So we have formed committees that now are looking at our wealth our group, our small business group, our commercial group, and our consumer lending group, and saying, how are we crossing the gamut across all of these in, in, a, in a lens of racial equity, um, as well as HR, and as well as supplier diversity, and as well as partnerships. You know, we do a lot of philanthropic uh, work, but how are, how are our philanthropic and are they working uh, across um, what we really want them to do? So that uh, that group is, um, I would say relatively new, but that's probably because it's been a long year. Mm -hmm. That group is since January of this year that you know we're really coming together and trying to have a cohesive strategy. Um, and it's an extremely passionate group. So it's pretty strong call to action. And we're actually set up to make some really nice announcements in mid-November of what we're really pegging our actions and our commitments in a multi-year plan are. Um, but until you do it holistically across an organization, which Neil has done at U.S. Bank, um, you don't move the dial. So you can't just have one call to action. It has to be in an organization like ours. It has to flow from the CEO all the way down and all the way across, mm -hmm. or you don't get it. Great. Thank you. Matt? Yeah, so my call to action would be to, to empower your staff and teams. So when we set out on our journey, um, two and a half years ago through our most recent strategic plan and our commitment to this work. And Neil and U.S. Bank have been incredible partners for us in helping us get our staff through um, two and a half day of anti-bias, anti-racism training. But we've intentionally, like the, the empowering staff, our staff has, our edit team uh, has the ability, if they feel that executive management is not listening to them, they have direct access to our board. Um, by empowering and giving accountability to staff. We are having just really robust conversations in credit. We have elevated and diversified our voices at the credit committee. We are doing much deeper audits of our lending work than I think we otherwise would have. 
Um, and there's such richness in the talent pool <laughs> across the organization. We're 115 strong at IFF. So if it's one call to action I would have, it would be to uh, empower your teams. Wonderful. Neil, I know you guys are doing a lot already, but what is next? Yeah. No, I think it's, I would just say um, the only thing that I wanted to call to action is to not check boxes, but check your biases. Um, and I think that is the biggest takeaway I want to leave with the group today is we can have these goals and set all these aspirational messagings and have these initiatives and programs in place and check the boxes and say we did it. We invested, you know, a billion dollars into black communities. But it, until we change our business practices and until we change our biases and really recognize the ways in which um, uh, we are, we are having a more of a negative impact than a positive impact on the black and brown communities across our country. Um, we will not make progress um, and we'll, we'll continue to fight these issues in five years from now and 10 mm -hmm. years from now and 50 years from now. Um, if we don't fight the biases and the, and the root causes of these issues head on. So again, I think let's not just check, check boxes, but let's check our biases in order to address these inequities. Awesome, I love that. And last word from you, Deborah, a quick. Okay. I do not have a, um, a super snappy call to action and, and Neil has nailed it again. So we'll just leave that one where it is. But let me say that um, for me as a longtime impact investor who always loves SOCAP because we see the whole glory of our impact investing social enterprise ecosystem unfortunately not in person this year um i, I really do believe impact investing has an abiding role to play in this racial ju justice journey that we you know must fight and must be on and must you know not let it just be a passing fad um, so certainly that's one call to action is don't don't let up, don't don't let your attention divert. These are crises and problems that have been with us for a long, long, long time. And what's happened with COVID is, of course, many of the inequities that people were blind to have become just glaringly front and center. And then um, the abuses and killings and things that have brought forth such an outcry, we just we have to keep um, uh, doing what we can uh, to fight for progress. One, two, this is going to sound, like I said from the beginning, very technocratic. I, I believe that catalytic capital, which is the form of impact investing that our foundation has particularly embraced, um, and which foundations are especially well suited to using, is a an essential part of the solution going forward and not just in the fight for racial justice, because that absolutely is the case, but also in fighting for climate change mitigation, uh, gender justice, and much more, because ultimately it is what Neil's saying, right? It is about doing investing that's authentic and driven by the impact and the mission. And it's not mechanistic. It's not a credit score. It's not a collateral ratio. It is taking each investment case by case and being willing to do the work to be flexible. Um, and as Matt was saying, to go argue with the hires up, higher up folks and tell them why they should be making the investment. It is about really um, helping impact investing realize its full potential for positive social, economic, and environmental change. And so now I will make one shameless plug since you let me go last year. Um, on Thursday, there will be a SOCAP panel on the Catalytic Capital Consortium and new grant making opportunities that we announced at the end of last week. And um, we'll have our colleague uh, from FSG, Harvey Coe, who's just published something about catalytic capital in SSIR speaking, and then the three foundations that are part of the consortium. So if you want to learn more about um, how we're going to build the knowledge base around this more patient, flexible, risk tolerant type of investing, um, that's your next step on the SOCAP agenda. With that, thank you all for joining us and have a good rest of your SOCAP session. Please be in touch via our social medias and um, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks.